Okay, everybody. Good morning to all. Uh, okay, so can you hear me now? So Shuli is saying my voice is not audible. Yes, I can hear you. All right. Uh, uh, good morning, all, and welcome to today, this Saturday's uh, uh, small mini workshop on introduction to Julia. Today, our speaker is Ayush Patnayak. He is working in Excadia Forum. Um, he is one who is helping us, actually helping me to learn Julia. So I just thought it will be great to, you know, uh, learn Julia from uh, a real expert. So without any delay, Ayush, it's yours. So hi everyone. I work at XKDI Forum as Suresh just mentioned. Uh, I primarily work on Julia. My research interest is in analyzing satellite data for making uh, economic inferences. You all can hear me, right? Voice is not audible. Yes, yes. I'm not audible. Uh, Very low. I can hear you. Let's see if I can increase the volume. Is this better? Is this better? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's better. Oh, I was actually using my computer's mic by mistake and not the mic that I had connected. So but that's why it isn't good. I think it should be fine now. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> so as Swarish mentioned, I uh, work at XKDR Forum on Julia. My research interest is in analyzing satellite data for making economic inferences. I'll come to my work a bit later. So, but before that, I want to say that satellite data sets are extremely large. So, you know, for each 500 by 500 meter square, you have a data point and, uh, you know, millions of data point over Earth. So that's why we needed efficient computing frameworks. And that's how I started using Julia. Um, some of you would have heard of Julia and maybe some of you would have used it. Uh, it's a relatively new language. It was developed at MIT by Jeff Benjamin, Alan Edelman, Stefan Karpinski, and Viral Shah, and it was launched in 2012. Uh, so our team has uh, these members, Ajay Shah, Susan Thomas, uh, Saurish Das, as, uh, as you, I mean, you know him. Uh, myself, Ayush Parnayak, Mausam Datta was also at uh, CMI and Chirag Anand. Uh, you can look up at xkdr.org. Uh, our goal is to improve statistics in Julia. So we're just starting and uh, we're just currently reading about it and uh, learning from other languages. And we'll start working sometime in November, uh, sometime in January. Um, we're taking the experience from R, Python, and other languages to design metaphors and abstractions in Julia. Uh, we're also writing many of the functions used in statistics that, that aren't available in Julia. So in, you know, in R, there are many, many things you can do, low S, smoothing spines, many things, uh, p-value test, um, many things you can do in R which are not there in Julia. And we feel that, uh, Julia can can replace R and it's it's better in many ways. So we'll we'll be implementing those functions in Julia as well. I want to announce this, and that's what I was discussing with um, uh, Saurish. That I want to announce this in the beginning, and perhaps I'll announce this at the end if there are more participants. Uh, we'll be hiring interns and full-time employees for the project. So MSc data science students can choose our project in their summer internship program. Sorry, is that right? The summer internship. Yes. Uh, the first year student can definitely join as a summer intern in XKDR uh, mm -hmm. on development, different uh, functionality development of Julia programming. <laughs> yeah, and also they can 
pursue that internship as a course after that semester finishes, right? Yes, they can continue. If they want, they can continue as an industry project for the yeah. and uh, second year students. If they want, they can take it as an industry project in the fourth semester, mm -hmm. which will begin from January 24th the, uh, next year, this January 24th. The, they will be in the fourth semester. If they want, they can take it as an industry project as well. And uh, after they graduate, they can, of course, apply for, for a full-time job. And yes. even now, if uh, anybody else is watching this, who's, uh, I mean, who's not a current student can also apply for a full-time job. And uh, also, we'll be part of Google Summer of Code. So you can apply through there also. And it might be beneficial from a resume point of view. <clears throat> I think the pay could be lower, but uh, it looks nice on your resume to be uh, be a be a part of Google's summer of code. Uh, and we will conduct a three-day workshop in February. There we will give you problem sets. We will interact with you and we might conduct a hackathon. So I'm thinking of something and maybe we'll just dis I'll discuss this with Sorish. Uh, and then students will be hired based on those outcomes, based on their outcomes. Um, also if you can if anybody's interested, you can commit uh, to online, you know, GitHub um repositories open source projects and we can uh, you know look at those and get a sense of uh, how interested you are in open source development so that's another way so either you can uh, you know attend a three-day workshop or you can you know commit to any open source project it may or may not be julia i mean it's better if it's julia but we just want to see if you are interested in uh, the uh, the idea of open source and free software Okay. So I'll come to our work so far. Um, we've built a package in Julia to study nighttime lights. So nighttime lights is a satellite data set uh, used as a proxy for economic data. Uh, essentially, there's a satellite which looks at night and takes pictures. Right? So since brighter places are more prosperous, nighttime lights becomes a useful tool to measure, eco measure the economy. This data set is at high geographical resolution and a monthly frequency. So it's much better than traditional economic data in many areas. So in India, uh, you, you don't have monthly data for uh, high, at high granularity. So such a data set is very useful. Uh, we've also written a paper on nighttime lights. And we notice in, in the paper, we notice there's a bias in radiance in cloudy months. And we've proposed a bias correction scheme. Uh, this scheme is also implemented in the Julia package. But what's important here uh, is that we're processing tens of gigabytes of data, right? And we, we can't wait for days uh, for the code to process. And that's why we need efficient computing frameworks. We first tried to do the project in Python. Uh, it was too slow in the beginning, but you can vectorize the code and you can put a lot of effort into, um, into improving the efficiency, uh, but you know, it, it, it takes too much effort and the code becomes unreadable. So I mean, you can use uh, compilers also in Python, but uh, it's not that it's natural to Python. Uh, Python wants to make the code easy and, and not that efficient. So that's our motivation uh, for this, for this workshop. So uh, I want to, I want to tell why we needed a new language, uh, Julia and that's kind of the motivation that you you can't do uh, big data set problems in Python. You need something more efficient. And in C and C++, you can do Fortran, you can try, but they are very difficult to program. They are not that, they're not that many packages. Um, you may not get that many collaborators. So that's the motivation. Right? And that's why uh, that I summarized this here. So R and Python focus on the ease of use and they aren't efficient for you know, big problems like climate modeling, where you have to process a lot of data and um, uh, <clears throat> at high efficiency. Uh, so code for scientific computing had to be written in Fortran and C++, which are difficult to use uh, for people who aren't computer scientists. Right? So it, you won't get that many collaborators, as I said. Uh, also, as data sets get bigger and bigger, there's a need for a new language, something that is fast, perhaps even faster than Fortran and C++, and which is easy to use at the same time, right? You don't have to 
put your effort in vectorizing. So why is so fundamentally why is for uh, why is C plus plus faster than R? Uh, fundamentally, R is interpreted and C plus plus is compiled. So for 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 example, you're writing a for loop, and instead of that for loop, you could vectorize it. So C plus plus the the compiler can and it would automatically make it vectorized. It would make it the most efficient uh, code assembly code possible, while R would just run the for loop. So fundamentally compilers are <clears throat> are faster but that's not the entire story there are many other reasons why c++ is faster i won't go into that i in fact i don't understand that that well uh, to to uh, teach it um, but r essentially tries to make it easier to use right so and c++ uh, was invented in a, at a time when there was not much computing power so they had to make it very very efficient Okay, now enter Julia. So Julia uses the latest development in compilers. So it is compiled and it uses LM, LLVM for just-in-time compilation of code. So imagine just imagine just doing writing your code in R, but it's compiled instead of interpreted. Uh, this makes Julia's speed comparable to that of C. Uh, so first, it's fast. And second, the syntax is much easier than C. It's... In, in fact, it's better than R and Python or MATLAB, in my opinion, because it has learned from these languages. It has learned, um, you know, what worked and what didn't work, what people liked, what was easy. Uh, so in Python, you have indexing, um, and you don't have the semicolon, the curly braces like you have in C. So they kind of understood that the curly braces and semicolons were a bit of a pain. If you miss one semicolon, then your entire code doesn't work. Uh, so they learned that, and then they thought that indexing wasn't uh, that good of an idea, uh, also because IDs don't work well with indexing. So it learned all of that from these languages, and uh, that's why I think the syntax is even better. So it's the easiest to code, and it's also the also one of the fastest, or at least comparable to C. So here's um, a comparison of the speeds. So this graph shows the comparison between different languages. On the x-axis, you have uh, the language, and on the y-axis, you have the speed compared to C. So how many times slower it is compared to C? Uh, so obviously, C is just 10 to the bar 0, which is one time slower than C. Uh, then you have Julia, which is comparable. Um, and then you see other languages. So you see R, which is you know about 100 times slower then C for, for many, so we're comparing many different processes here, uh, iterative by some matrix multiplication, uh, recursion Fibonacci. Uh, and yeah, so you see Go is also very fast, but Go is a very domain specific language for networking, uh, handling web calls and all that. Uh, Rust is also domain specific. so. You know, you can't use it for everything, but yeah, there are other languages also which are fast, but Julia is more multi-purpose and it's still comparable to C and Fortran. I won't run these benchmarks. You can can look up in, uh, look up at julialang.org slash benchmarks. Uh, they have, I think they have a detailed, um, uh, a detailed article on this, uh, on this graph. Okay, so uh, just, just take my word on it for now that Julia is comparable to C in this in terms of speed. Now I'll come to the syntax and the ease of use. So it looks like Python, right? So you say A equals 10 or name equals Ayush. So A equals 10 means uh, integer A uh, equals equal to 10 and name equal to Ayush, which is a string, right? I can just run this and uh, you can even you know, print 10. So it looks slower in here. It's because when you run something for the first time, when you run a function or a line for the first time, it compiles it on the fly and then runs it. So the first run is always slower. And after that, it's faster. So imagine you were uh, running a function a million times. So only the first time it will be a bit slower and then it'll be it'd be comparable to C. But first run, it will be even slower than R or Python, but that's not important. 
uh, you can also pre-compile all your code. So uh, you can just write one pre-compile function. It'll take a few seconds to pre-compile all your code. And then it'll be, you know, all of it will be very fast. And here I've made a, I made a simple control flow. So if uh, a less than 10, then print small, else print big end. So you see there's an end here. Uh, so instead of the semi uh, instead of curly braces, open curly braces, small that you have in R, we just have one end. So it's already smaller. And also there's no, uh, so in Python, you would have a colon here, right? And in Python, the indexing would matter. Here, the indexing doesn't matter. I can just do this and it will still work. So that's, that, that's a, that's a, you know, they've made the, uh, they've, they make you use fewer characters and also the indexing is a real pain when you try to debug code or when you you know do um so suppose i just wanted to run this line right and then i can do shift uh shift uh enter to run that line and i i can similarly run this line as well right in an id but if you were in python then it would not allow you to run this line because there would be an in indexing and it reduces the number just has an end and this is because it has learned from all the languages if if julia was invented in 1980 then it would still it would still have curly braces and maybe it would not have semicolons but it would be more similar to c now because it has learned from python and r uh, it is it has made the syntax easier i've written a for loop here it's a simple one to ten you just print the numbers. It's also just an end here. So everything uh, just has an end. I've written a function below. It also has uh, just curly braces open, no curly braces close, no colon, no need for indexing also. So a function can have a compact definition also. So for example, iterator x equals x plus one. It's a compact definition. It looks like you're writing a math equation, right? Uh, I think this idea is taken from MATLAB if I'm not wrong. And then you can have a long multi-line definition also. So it's for bigger functions. So you can say function iterator of x, return x plus one, end. Right. Uh, are there any questions? Can you hear me? Oh, uh, so you are yes. using uh, deep note are you using deep note or this is uh, a jupyter notebook actually oh okay okay great so i just made it into so a... I, I had... hmm. Hmm. so uh so if you so most of our students actually uses jupyter notebook mm -hmm. so uh do you need, uh so if you just can uh sometimes just show how to sync the jupyter notebook with the python uh julia that yeah. will be great uh Okay, let me see if I can do it right now. So can you see the screen? Uh, so this is the notebook. So here you can see slideshow.i pynb. So that's the Jupyter notebook. Uh, and then here, if you go to new, you can select the kernel. And here you have the option for Julia. And I'll come to how you can link that at the end. So how you can just have a kernel here. Sure, 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 sure. sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, I just wanted a Jupyter notebook instead of a PDF slideshow so that I can run the code and it's a bit more uh, you know, interactive uh, this way. Yeah, makes so sense. Makes sense. Now I'll Thank just you. talk a bit more about the ease of use and the syntax. So I've taken this example from this GitHub repository. Uh, this is, I'll, I'll just show some linear algebra operations, right? So I say using linear algebra and that will, uh, uh, you know, get some functions that we have for linear algebra, um, mainly from, uh, LAPAC. So, uh, here's an example. So we make a random eight by eight matrix, then we can transpose it. So we can just say a prime to transpose it. Uh, then we can just say a multiply. So that would do the matrix multiplication. Uh, so B equal to A times A transpose and C equals A. Uh, so 
if you want to do an element wise so anything element wise uh, you can do with a dot so c equals a dot star a so it will do the element wise multiplication i'll show you one more example of element wise um uh, uh, so to apply anything element wise so d equals iterator dot a so remember we had made this iterator here x equals x plus one so it would just apply that function iterator on all the elements of a so that's what this dot does it says apply on all you can also write a for loop the, uh, or a while loop that goes over the rows and columns but it's easier and actually the compiler would automatically uh, write the assembly code so that the two are the same so either you write a for loop or you write a dot you would get the same performance in python if you write a for loop then it'll be slower than if you do a map right so this is essentially a map so it's a vectorized vectorized code but in python you will have to vectorize it manually you can't you know the the code will not automatically get converted into uh, fast efficient vectorized code but but uh, in julia because it's compiled it would automatically do that right and here's one more example of element wise uh, applying something so a dot plus 1 equal to equal to d so a dot plus 1 is the element wise uh, function basically so it would also add 1 to all the elements uh, we can just check if that those two are equal and that's true okay so uh, i feel that this is the simplest linear algebra syntax that i've seen so a prime or just a multiplication sign for uh, matrix multiplication then uh, just a dot multiply sign for element wise multiplication so again it's i feel it's much better than um numpy or matlab okay uh, now i'll just show one more example of the intuitive syntax that is solving linear equations so suppose you create a matrix eight by eight again a random matrix so again how simple is this syntax rand eight comma eight in r you have r norm uh, yeah i mean r you we could have julia people could have picked r norm here also but they just felt that saying rand is easier uh, and then we make a random eight dimensional vector also so uh, rand eight uh, now if you want to solve the system of linear equations ax equals b then you just run x equals a by b and it will solve okay so in summary uh, julia's speed is comparable to c primarily because it is compiled but also because it uses the modern knowledge of uh, compilers and uh, language design uh, which r and python don't because they're old um, but yeah primarily because they're compiled so the code automatically is written to the most efficient assembly code and the syntax is easy and intuitive right so i just demonstrated a few examples and it's arguably more intuitive than uh, than python or r but it's not only the syntax that is better there are many other aspects that are superior in uh, julia compared to r or python so uh, in r if you try to install a package i think 80 or 90 percent of the times you get an error right it just it just says non zero exit code and then you have to struggle to install the package it just never happens in julia the package management is so perfect that if there's a stable package and if you just say pkg add package name then it just works right it just installs it with, like without any uh, any more you know fiddling around or you know trying to go into sudo and install some library so that is because of uh, how the language design is how package management works so and all of that is modern knowledge because Julia was launched in 2012. So they could use a lot of the knowledge that was built upon uh, by uh, Python and R. Okay. Uh, there's one more thing I want to cover, and then I want to go into the second part of the workshop, which is you know getting started with Julia, downloading and installing and all that. And uh, I'm also presenting a similar workshop somewhere else. So that person asked me to include it. And that's why I want to show it. It's very useful. And I've also used that. And that is the communication with other languages. 
So Julia allows calling C and Fortran shared libraries with no compromise on speed, right? So you can, you know, compile a C code as a .so file or a Fortran code as a .so file. And then you can just call those functions in Julia and you will get the speed of C or Fortran, which is of course comparable to Julia in many cases faster also. Uh, so for example, you know, the, you can have LAPAC or BLAST libraries. That's a very simple example, but, but you can also do that in R and Python. So it's not a, it's not a very big difference. Um, but yeah, this it's, it's, uh, it's nice to have that you can call C functions. Uh, it also allows users to call Python, R and MATLAB functions. So that's very interesting in our nightlights code. Many places at many places we were stuck and we had to use some R code and it, it's very useful. So these are a bit slow. You would get the speed of R or actually less, a bit less, maybe 90% of R if you're calling an R function or uh, maybe 95% of the Python speed if you're calling a Python function. Um, but they're very useful. And of course, if they're comparable to R, then you know it's still superior to using R if most of your code is in Julia. Uh, so at one point, uh, half of our code was in R. We were using, uh, we were calling R functions in Julia, and then slowly we started replacing those with Julia functions. So that's that's why it's uh, easy to shift to Julia from another language because if some function is missing, then you can just uh, call it. I'll show you some examples. So here is pi call. So we just write in this format. So pi um triple quotes import numpy as np uh right so suppose i want to call a numpy function so i do import numpy as np then i define that function define g of x at, uh, as return uh, np dot sign sign x plus np dot cos x, uh, pi times x y two so that's that's a function that uh, that i've defined i can i can define anything else i i'll, I'll just uh, define something else right now after this uh, and then I can use PyCall, uh, and then I can convert that Python function to a Julia function for ease of use, right? So I can just say f of x equals pi g of x, right? So then I get a function called f of x in Julia. Now the speed is not as fast as as a Julia function; it's comparable to the to a function of Python, but still, it's it's sometimes useful to have because, for example, uh, uh, scikit-learn is not there in Julia. So we call, uh, so we use PyCall and scikit-learn is written in C, I think. So you get the speed of C, right? And then I can just use this function like any other Julia function, right? I can just say F of 2.3 and then I get a value. And suppose I can, you know, do something else also. It, uh, I just gave an example of a function, but I can, can just, uh, you know, type something else. Uh, then similarly, I would get a function that uh, a Julia function from a Python function. So this is very useful. In the beginning, Julia did not have its own plotting uh, plotting functions. So now it has plots, but earlier they were using matplotlib. And you know, for plotting speed is not that critical in many cases. So uh, matplotlib was, was used. So everyone was using PyCall and mat, matplotlib. Okay, so similarly, you can call R functions. So here you had pi triple quotes and then a you know a Python a code. You can you know write a lot of code here. It doesn't have to be this short. Uh, but yeah, you had pi triple quotes, some code, and then triple quotes. Similarly, in R, you would have R triple quotes, some R code, and triple quotes again. So we say using R call. That is the package that allows you to call R functions. So you see, uh, the function I want to use is TS clean from forecast package. So this function removes outliers in time series. So I say R outlier rem function library forecast return TS clean, right? Uh, I can even, I think I can copy this here also. And then I just, yeah, here uh, function remove outliers array. So I can just convert that into a Julia function. And now I can just run it like any other Julia function. So array, <clears throat> uh, I just created a random array from one to 10 of 10 elements here. 
Then I just run that function, remove out as, just as any other Julia function. So I felt this is quite, quite important, um, quite useful actually, uh, to know that you can call R and Python functions so easily. You can also do it with MATLAB um, and, and I think few other languages. Uh, and C and Fortran, of course, you can call all the shared libraries just as you do in other languages. Okay. Now I come to the second part of the workshop, which is downloading Julia. I'll show you the REPL. Uh, that's the interface of Julia. Uh, then ID is for development. For de sorry, for development. So how do you you know generally write code in Julia? And I'll share some learning resources. And finally, I'll come to the community and getting help. And I think the fifth one is the most important. So I think uh, you should wait till the end. Because it won't take that long. So, uh, sorry, before that, does anyone have any questions? Anyone any question? Okay, I think I wish. Okay, I can continue. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'll first come to downloading Julia. Um, it's, it's it's just a binary file so you just go to this website julialang.org slash downloads and you can just download a binary there uh you can just if it's an if you're on windows it's just an exe file you just run that if you're on mac i think it'll be dot pkg and then you can just put it in your applications or dot dmg and then you can just put it in applications in linux it'll be just a just a uh executable file, executable binary. It will be a folder. So it will have all the uh, other files in that folder that are needed to run, uh, needed to run uh, Julia. Uh, so you, it doesn't, you don't need sudo or anything else to run Julia, right? It just contains everything. And if you add any other package, then it'll go to the same folder. So that way they've made it very, very simple to use, very simple to download. And that's why you never get an error when uh, you install packages. Uh, it's because, yeah, everything is contained in one folder. Uh, you can also do that, I think, in uh, if you're using Conda for R or uh, Python, uh, then also it goes in one folder. So I think Conda is also trying to do the same, but in many occasions you have, you end up with different versions of R, different versions of uh, Python, and you know it's all mixed up, so it's a problem. Uh, now, in, uh, I'll just show you this page. I think I can just open this URL. Yeah. Uh, so it just gives you just the download link. So I think in Windows, you have an installer, but uh, you can also use the portable .exe file. So that's just a... Um, uh, so that's just uh, uh, you know a binary file that you just run that I was just explaining. But if you do the installer, uh, then uh, it automatically attaches to the uh, to the Jupyter notebook, right? So in so if you do the portable, then you'll have to uh, add it to some path. But if you just do the installer, then it automatically attach. Uh, for macOS, it should attach automatically to um, to Jupyter. Uh, I, I think you may have to add a package in Julia for for Jupyter Notebook. So I, I just don't remember the name of the package, but you just I, I'll just show you how you add packages and then you just add that one package and then it'll work with Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, for Mac, you have different versions. I mean, you can do it on the latest ARM Mac. Uh, for Linux also, you have uh you can have arm linux and for different versions and they're all binaries okay um yeah i'll go back so basically there's there's no uh installation and there's just a simple file uh, everything is contained and it's very very simple okay now i'll come to the repl and that's an interface and it's very similar to what you've seen in r and python so let me just show you in my terminal so I can just say Julia and here you can see that I can do things um, that I was just showing to you on 
Jupyter Notebook. Right. Right. So this is a this is an interface that just is similar to what you've seen in R in Python. And this is why it's easier to use than partly why it's easier to use than Fortran or C. Right. So in uh, Fortran, C++, of course, the, the syntax is much harder because they're older languages. In C++, you have curly braces, semicolons, but also that you can't do this. Like you can't just run the code on the fly, uh, at least in the traditional version of C++. Now, now there are, people have actually released an interface like this for C++ uh, in, in using the same LLVM that I was talking about. So it just, it just compiles the code on the fly. But traditionally, the case with C++ was that you had to write everything in a file and then compile it and then you had to run it right you can't you could not just do it like this so this is yeah one of the advantages and it's very very similar to r and python okay and i can just say exit to exit uh now i'll tell you about ides for julia uh, so if some of you use Emacs, then you can just use the ESS package for Julia. It, it just, it just works for Julia. Also, it's, I think it's primarily for R, but, uh, it basically means Emacs speaks statistics. So it also works, uh, for Julia and there's a package called Juno for Atom. So Atom is also an IDE an open source ID, but Juno has stopped receiving updates. So I would not recommend you to use Juno. And in fact, Atom is also not getting that many updates. So it's also getting outdated. The main one is the Julia extension on VS Code, Visual Studio Code. And Visual Studio Code is the most preferred ID for Julia. Right? So you, I mean, there are many other IDs, but uh, VS Code is the most preferred. And it's also part of the Google Summer of Code project. So basically they are, quite serious about developing the VS Code Julia extension. I'll just show you the extension in a bit. So, so I just made a file called tutorial.jl. Um, yeah, so if you have a Julia program, then you save it in a .jl file. I can just say code tutorial.jl. And then the VS Code starts. Right. And uh, I have installed the uh, extension uh, for Julia. You can do it with, uh, you can go to file preferences, uh, extensions. There you can do Julia. And yeah, this is the Julia extension. Okay. So uh, you need to install Julia and then Linux, you need to add, uh, you don't, you need to download Julia. You need to install the extension and you need to add Julia to your path. So in Linux, you have the executable path and then you just add the, uh, uh, the path of the executable file that you downloaded for Julia into that path. And then this thing works. Okay. So you can do control enter. You can do control enter to start the interpreter, uh, to start the ripple. And it just takes a bit, but it will, so control enter, uh, will compile this entire function. So it understands where the function starts and where the function ends, and it will just compile the whole thing. So if I do control enter, I get a function test size, generic function, right? And if I want to execute a single line, I can do shift enter. And, uh, yeah, I just run that particular line. Okay. Or, and I can, so uh, an REPL is, uh, is in the bottom of the screen. So here I can just run the function or I can type here and then run. So either control enter or shift enter, uh, control enter will also show some part of the output here. And if you hover, it will show the, I think it should show some more details. For auto completion, um, you can use tab nine. Uh, it works with other languages also, but um, I think it's the best one for Julia. Okay. 
So I've shown you the IDs, I've shown you the REPL. Um, it's again, very simple to use. Uh, and that's what, that's what makes it better than C++, C and Fortran. Speed is comparable, but it's much easier. Okay, now I'll come to some learning resources. Um, so if you're attending the workshop, then you probably want to do some of these beforehand. Uh, so there's a YouTube channel called Julia for talented amateurs. Uh, this is the URL. It's, it's quite entertaining. I mean, he has a lot of jokes. Uh, it's just, it's just very uh, entertaining and it has two playlists. So a basic Julia and a Julia for data science. So MSc data science students can do both. And uh, the first one, I think everyone should do, everyone should learn Julia and everyone should do the first course. And if you want to do a full course with you know, with programs, problem sets, etc. then you can do the Julia Academy course. I believe it is done by Stanford. So it's also uh, quite a high level uh, course. Mm, yeah, they give you, they allow you to type there and, uh, you know, do Julia programming uh, on the website. Okay. Now we'll come to an important part, which is the community. And uh, so really the world's best minds are building and using the language. So you see the projects that are happening in Julia, the big ones. So for example, Climate Machine uh, is the biggest project. Uh, in Climate, Climate Machine is a Caltech university project. Uh, there, uh, they are building climate modeling from scratch. They are, it's using the biggest data sets on climate. It's the most advanced climate modeling. Right for you know uh, droughts, predicting droughts, uh, predicting rainfall, etc. Uh, one more project I uh, came across was ITER. Uh, that's the hydrogen fusion project, and they are also modeling in Julia. So they're really the best people of the best fields are there in Julia, and and I think that's what is making Julia so good um, because. A, a physicist, for example, uh, is not a computer scientist also. So he or she will struggle with Fortran, with C++, but with Julia, they're able to write programs as well. So the best physics programs, the best chemistry, the best biology programs are written in Julia now. And all that community is coming together. So uh, the second part is that every year around August, there's a conference called JuliaCon. So all these people meet there and present their work. So if you just take part in that, then interacting will be interacting with the people is transformational. Um, just just talking to all these people from the the best people from the best fields who are uh, you know who want to use computer science and Julia is the only way for them. So for example, you want to see uh, interactions between uh, chemicals, interaction between medicines. So you need some simulations and. Uh, those are extremely complicated and people can't use uh, Python or R because it's a more efficient framework. Uh, so they use Julia and they're really the best. Hello, are you sure there? And so they will give you, so uh, this year they, uh, I attended and they gave me a three minute slot, but even that much is, is quite good so uh, that I can at least. Ayush. Yeah. Yeah. You dropped off for a few seconds, perhaps. Can you just, uh, so we missed you for about 15, 20 seconds. Okay. Yeah. So I'll, uh, I'll repeat it. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, Julia Khan will be, is really can really be transformational for you. And so if you just make an open source project, or if you contribute to one, uh, and then you apply to JuliaCon, then in all probability, they will accept you. Uh, this year, they gave me a three minute slot. They do, I mean, uh, if depending on the project, they give you, they can give you a very small or a very large slot. Uh, they gave me a three minute slot, but even that is good enough because I get to interact with people, right? So just, and, and they usually accept, they give you, they can give you very small uh, time limits, but they usually accept. And uh, that's why I think all of you should 
take part in this. Uh, you will get to interact with the best of the best people there. Okay, so I think that's the uh, that's that's the I, I believe it's even more important. Uh, the community is even more important than how simple the language is or how fast the language is. Uh, it's really like the Manhattan Project right now. Uh, the the best physicists, the best chemists, the best biologists are there. Okay, uh, now I'll come to getting help. So there's a website discourse.julialang.org. So it is a bit like Stack Overflow where you just ask questions and people reply and it's only focused on Julia. And there are topics uh, that they come up with and you can discuss those topics as well. And the second is julialang.slack.com. So it's a chat service. So maybe I can just show it to you now. Taking a bit. Yeah. So here, uh, there are many different channels. Uh, and uh, so each package generally has a channel, uh, or each organization has a channel. So there's a organization called Julia Geo. And here there's all the conversation about uh, about uh, the uh, uh, the Geo uh, package and you know, Earth related packages. Uh, and for example, there's one more called image processing. And here people talk about uh, image processing programs and just regular question. And here you get to interact with uh, with the creators of the packages and also the creator of the language as well and statistics uh, so people just you know talk it's 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 a bit informal so they, they just talk in in regular language and they just mention their problems directly instead of uh, you know too much uh, too much background if you have uh, any more doubts about a package specifically then you can even uh, you know, you can even contact, you can even message the uh, founder of the package or the creator of the package, right? So you can direct message people. I wouldn't recommend doing that, but uh, because if you have any doubt, then it should go to the entire community because other people may have the same doubts. Um, but yeah, you can do that. I have done it before. Um, yeah, and you can just ask simple questions and nobody mind if the questions are too simple. For example, this person writes, hi everyone, I'm new to Julia, right? And then it's a very simple uh, error. And then somebody would help him. So uh, they have, I, I don't think any other language has this kind of a platform for, uh, for help. Uh, so I, th I think this is because it's an MIT project. So they started this and uh, many, many people came together. So there was some leadership in this language uh, that decided to do these things. And that's why we are there. I think in R, there was an R help mailing list in the beginning, some, I think 20 years ago. And I think it's still continuing, but it's mainly now on Stack Overflow and Stack Exchange, but there you cannot ask in such informal ways and you cannot keep chatting. And also they're, they're slow. I mean, if you ask a question on, on Stack Overflow, the answer will come in like two or three days. Okay, so actually, I think I ended a bit early. This was the last. I had not timed it properly. So I think I went over too quickly. So I think a few more people have joined. So I'll make the announcement again. Uh, so we'll be hiring uh, interns and full time employees for the for our Julia project. So our Julia project is about building statistics in Julia. Uh, MSc data science students can choose the project to the project in the summer internship program. They can pursue the internship as a course after the summer internship finishes. I think this is for the first year students. The second year students can take it as an industry course. Uh, of course, everyone can apply for a full-time job with Aesthetics KDR. We will also be part of uh, Google Summer of Code and that might look nice on your resume. So if you 
uh, apply through there. The pay may be a little lower, but um, if you want to work in Google in the future or if you want to apply somewhere else, then it might be better. Uh, we will conduct a three-day workshop in February. You know, we will give problem sets and we might conduct a hackathon. So students will be hired based on those, based on their outcomes. Also, if you can, if you, if you contribute to open source packages, that will increase the chances of, of, uh, of your, of you getting hired. So I had left mm -hmm. some time for questions, uh, but uh, I think it's still a bit too much time. But anyway, so are there any questions? Um, just quick point that I would like to make that uh, the students, uh, the second year students, if you want to do an industry project uh, next semester, then probably you should contact me ASAP on the, on the Julia. So just, uh, just to let you know, because your semester will start in January 24th, so you have to start working right away. Uh, but otherwise, uh, the, the first year students, those of you who are here, uh, if you want to uh, do the, if you want to consider a summer, in, uh, summer internship at XKDR -er possibility or Google Summer of Code, uh, also another possibility, then please do learn Julia and please do attend our February workshop, which will be a much larger workshop with a lot more uh, resource person and uh, so please do attend that and uh, and then definitely apply and we will we will in we will tell you the application process and all in the way so please uh, or let me know or let ayush know uh, about your interest yeah you can just email email me at uh, ayushpadnayak at gmail.com uh, So if you're interested in any of this, and if you want to ask, you know, how you can start contributing to open source projects or how you can, you know, you can even start contributing to our nightlights package right now. And, you know, if you're interested, then you can, uh, you know, we can hire you after you graduate or uh, we, we can uh, give you an internship, but you can even start communicating with us right now. Yeah, uh, I wanted to know about like in GSOC you mentioned that there is a project for VS Code. Yeah. But uh, is there any project regarding package building, whatever you were mentioning? Is there anything regarding package? Can yeah. you come on? Yeah, yeah. Like, is there anything regarding package, uh, package updation or something? Whatever you were mentioning, like for statistics, you were yeah. building Julia libraries. Yeah. Yeah, there, there are many, many projects on Google. Sum. Let me just actually open the Google Summer of Code Julia project and then we can maybe discuss there. Yeah, 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 sure. So, yeah, there are many, many different uh, um, projects and I think. I, this is the this is one of the critical ones that I see uh, automatic differentiation differentiation uh, because this is basically analytical differentiation instead of numeric. But anyway, there there are many other uh, open source projects in Google Summer of Code. So basically, they have GitHub uh, uh, they have uh, GitHub pages and you can just contribute to the code there. Um, or you can take part. I mean, you can look at the code. If you feel that you, you'll be able to contribute, then you can just apply to Google Summer of Code. Right? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't see the Visual Studio Code one here. Uh, maybe it's, maybe it hasn't yet started, um, or it has, or it has finished. But uh, yeah, it used to be there. Uh, so actually, this thing during this past year's project, I think, uh, 2021. Yeah, they are here to update the pages. Hmm. Yeah. So actually, this is what uh, convinced us to start Julia Statistics during .jl. So 
it allows you to do problem probabilistic programming natively in Julia instead of doing it some other language and then porting it. So in R, you you have to write in I believe in some other language uh, and then import that code. But in Julia, you can natively do it, and uh, it's it's a very nice syntax, and it's been done from ground up, um, and it's fast, of course. So this is what really convinced us to um, do statistics in Julia. Yeah, maybe they'll update the update the Google Summer of Code uh, list for 2021. I think this is last year. I think it's uh, the Google Summer of Code is limited to summer. I think only three months in summer, I believe. Um, but you can do the internship with us in uh, in January or something. Uh, so uh, when is the internship, Sorish? So, so summer internship can uh, will be typically for the first year students. Uh, that will be May, June, July, May, uh, June. and that and uh, the second year student, the uh, Shuli is in second year. Mm -hmm. So second year students can start the industry project. Uh, if they want with us from January. Okay, that's great. Then yeah, we can just start in January. And then uh, if you, uh, so if you apply for Google Summer of Code, then they will give your profile to us. So, I mean, if you do the internship, if you do the industry project with us, and if you do well, and then you apply for Google Summer of Code, then they will give your um, details. I mean, then they'll give your profile to us. And then we can, uh, you know, recommend you for Google Summer of Code also. Uh, so uh, yeah, in January you can start the industry project, and then in summer you can do Google Summer of Code, or you, uh, yeah, or you can if you graduate then you can do full time with us also. So either way. So any more questions? As there is a time, can you please show us uh, your recent work on that satellite data? Uh, so I, I didn't get it. So uh, do you want me to uh, show the satellite data? No, no, your work, like uh, whatever you are doing in that project. Okay, so maybe I can show you the, uh, maybe the, the paper I can show, uh, or maybe I can explain in more detail. So, um, so basically, uh, in 2012, there was the satellite uh, launch Suomi NPP, and it has a sensor called Weeds, and it basically looks at infrared light, and from that it can find out uh, the brightness of a place, and uh, intuitively you can guess that more prosperous places are brighter, right? So Mumbai would be brighter than you know, a village in Rajasthan or that or a desert, right? So you can kind of get prosperity by looking at Earth at night. So just from the satellite images, you can get uh, prosperity. So other people have also used this. So for example, the World Bank has used this data set a lot. So they have done a study on demonetization, for example. Uh, they look at the impact of demonetization through uh, space, uh, from space. Uh, so they look at the total amount of light in India before and after demonetization. And uh, they see that during demonetization, there was a small slump, but then after that, there was a sharp rise. So, and you can do that only if you have high frequency data, right? You have high frequency, uh, you have data every month or every, uh, every day actually so this satellite does uh, takes the pictures every day but it's so difficult to process the daily data that we have resorted to using monthly and also monthly averages are cleaner than and than daily but you can actually use the daily data set or the monthly or you can make it weekly so that's what uh, people have done for demonetization world bank has also done the, the same study for a similar study for covid 19 impact in india so they looked at different districts and they had the monthly aggregate nighttime lights, uh, monthly aggregate brightness basically of each district. And they showed that wherever uh, COVID uh, 
impact was high those districts had lower light uh, in so during the during the outbreaks so uh, yeah you can do high frequency and high granularity studies using this data set and we have made an open source package that analyzes it so what this does is that it cleans the data there are many many cleaning procedures uh, you remove background noise you remove outliers and we've done that uh, in the julia package so we've implemented all those in an open source format where everyone can you know scrutinize the code they can use it and they can also check if our process is are good and also it's been uh, also uh, it's more efficient so uh, i think for the world bank's project uh, that they did for over 19 it would take days and days to you know produce the results but in our uh, in using our package you can produce those results in a few hours um so it's more efficient it's open source so people can criticize the code people can look at it people can suggest different ways um and we've written a paper and we can also you know we can replicate uh, if we want wanted to we could replicate the covid-19 paper very quickly we can replicate uh, the demonetization paper so this package has the ability to basically deal with all kinds of problems that you will have related to night and lights also it has some new procedures that we have uh, written in the paper so we've discovered there's a bias and we correct for that bias and that cleaning procedure is also there in the package so this package has all the cleaning procedures that other people use and also want more that we have discovered uh, and people have already started using this package for their night uh, their night lights work uh, so yeah so uh, that's that's the that's my work uh, for the it it took us a year and a half to make this package actually so because we had to learn julia from scratch we, more than learning julia it was about learning the cleaning processes and learning night lights because we're new to the field so it took us a while it took us a year to write this uh, paper and write this make this package but now we can just start you know doing more and more research on night lights Thank you, Ayush. Any other question? Um, if you guys have, it, it was nice introduction, Ayush. Thank you. Um, if you uh, have no other question, so let's thanks Ayush once. Um, and then um, thank you, Ayush. And again, as we discussed, if you want to, uh, you know, work with Julia, just write to me or write to Ayush, and uh, we will take it from there. And uh, so, with this, I think now we can close the session. And thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.